Amen. Well, I want to thank those that came uh, for our uh, church history class that we just started. And I uh, hope that was a blessing to you. It's going to be really interesting uh, as we get further and further into church history. Uh, I don't know. If, if you're anything like me, you're going to start getting pumped up. And uh, just to hear what our what our forefathers went through and stand for the faith. Amen. All right. Um, Go ahead and open up your Bible to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Now I heard something over the week. Um, now there's a, there's a movement uh, that's wide open right now called uh, the hashtag Me Too movement. I don't know if you've heard of this. This has to do with the uh, Hollywood uh, ladies that are um, claiming that guess that they were sexually harassed or even raped. Um, now, in the midst of getting their roles and fame, okay, so they've, they've started this movement. And um, now I'm going to point out to you, and I think it's pretty heavily documented, that most of these people in Hollywood have already sold their souls to the devil. Amen. And, um, and they did whatever it took to get where they are. And so it's kind of interesting that now they're looking back and trying to act like they're moral agents, you know, that can de demand morality from other people when they're not going to submit to morality themselves. So um, there's been various people coming out actually against the movement who were or still are involved in what we call the Hollywood industry. Um, among these that came out, uh, about the truth of the beast of Hollywood is Pamela Anderson, a longtime Hollywood harlot. Amen? She is? Oh, yeah. Amen. To everyone's amazement, she said that, well, something to the effect of this. Um, she said it's a lost cause, this whole Me Too movement. She pointed out that when she was in her heyday, she had been offered many things for relations, like cars, houses, etc., uh, she also commented on the Me Too's as idiots in the sense that when you're invited to a private audition in a hotel room alone, what do you expect? Amen. This just goes to show that there are temptations in Hollywood, in the industry, that are common knowledge, and the only way to truly protest this monster is to leave. And bring everyone that you can out with you out of that beast and then be separate but this thing about temptations you know we're, we're going to be looking at the topic of temptation today there's much to be said but I don't think there's any greater example if you want to learn about temptation to look at the victor of temptation Jesus Christ so we're in Matthew or I'm sorry uh, we're yeah Matthew chapter 4 for some reason I was at Mark Matthew chapter 4. I'm going to read a few verses to you, so be with me for a moment. It says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward in hunger. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into, a whole, into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou, shalt, uh, thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh them up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth them all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him. And behold, the angels came and ministered unto him. So we're going to look at, the today is going to be a little bit different than what I normally do. This is going to be more like a little Bible study. We're just going to 
tackle this thing verse by verse, okay? So it's not going to have a bunch of uh, A's or a bunch of numbers or whatever. So just be with me, okay? So we're going to first look at this. Is it a sin to be tempted? Well, we're there in verse 1. Look at verse 1. It says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be what? Tempted. So, no, it cannot be a sin to be tempted because Jesus Christ Himself was tempted. He is sinless. Look at Hebrews 4.15. Hebrews 4.15. You guys brought your uh, reading glasses and your turning fingers. We're going to read some verses today. Hebrews 4.15, it says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, see how he was tempted? Like as we are, yet without sin. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is it a sin to be tempted? The answer is no. It's not a sin to be tempted. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.21. 2 Corinthians 5.21 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 It says this, For He hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Mm -hmm. See that? See, this is a Bible claim that Jesus Christ was sinless. Look at uh, 1 Peter 2.21 1 Peter 2.21 1 Peter chapter 2 in verse 21. And it says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. Uh, 1 Peter 2 21. Where am I? Um, yes. Thank you. And then in verse 22 it says, Who did no sin? Neither was our God found in his mouth. So still, there, there might be those that say this, and I'm sure you've talked to them, or at least heard of situations like this. Where did Jesus claim to be sinless? Look at John chapter 8. John chapter 8. John chapter 8. In verse 46. John chapter 8. In verse 46. Asks a very relevant question to the Pharisees. He says, Which of you convinceth me of sin? You, you understand nobody answered, right? Uh, he, even when they ultimately crucified him, they gave him a mock trial. They had a bunch of false witnesses. And it was apparent that they were false witnesses because the man was sinless. But we're going to learn much from this verse that the temptation itself is not the sin in and of itself. Now, you can, you can look into, we, we've talked about here, the doctrine of peccability. There is presentation, which is the temptation. That's, you haven't entered sin yet. There's presentation. There's illumination, number two. That's where you're pondering now, is this thing that's been presented to me right or wrong? Sin still has an answer. It's entered. Uh, but the third point there where sin entered is, is debate. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ never entered into that debate at all. Now, um, this is how Jesus Christ you know, uh, would say that he, a man could be guilty of adultery before he ever even committed it. See? Why? Because it was the debate. This is how you can be guilty of murder with ever actually executing anybody. Uh, you... you you know, we, we try somebody in a court because they've murdered. You know, we call them a murderer because they've murdered. God calls them a murderer before they murder. Why? Because it was in their heart. Mm -hmm. So, uh, let's look then uh, at our next verse there. We're back in uh, Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. And look at... We're going to look at Jesus' preparation to do battle with the devil in verse 2. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward in hunger. Mm -hmm. Now, fasting is to fight spiritually. Now, there's a power that's given to the Christian spiritually when there's a fast implemented. The fasting can be food, 
It can be water or both. Fasting is a good way to put one of the three enemies of God in line. Can you guess which one it is? The flesh. The flesh. Puts the flesh right in line. It says, you know what? I'm not serving you. I'm serving the Lord. Uh, look at Exodus 34, 28. We're going to see that uh, Moses fasted. Exodus 34, 28. Exodus chapter 34 and verse 28. It says, And he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Uh, now look at Matthew 17 and verse 18. Matthew 17 and verse 18. Matthew chapter 17 and verse 18. It says, And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then uh, came the disciples to Jesus' part and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto him, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall be removed. And it says, uh, and, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Verse 21. How be it? This kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. So the next question then is, what is a biblical fast? What is a biblical fast? A biblical fast is to focus one's attention wholly toward God, abstaining from lawful pleasantries to the end of resolving certain extraordinary spiritual needs. It incorporates the following. Number one, abstinence from food and normal physical pleasure. So you're not just kind of going around. You're, you're taking this time that you'd be normally doing your regular things. And you're slowing down and you're focusing on the Lord. See? Uh, number two, prayer. You're not going to be having a fast if you're not praying. It's not a diet. Okay? Uh, some people, they... They think that fasting is, is a diet. And no, you're not fasting unless you're not unless you're in prayer. Then number three, confessions of sins. Now, this is not to a Catholic priest, amen? This is to the Lord, amen? And uh, then fourthly, service toward God. Um, do something for the Lord while you're fasting. Do something that you wouldn't be normally doing for the Lord. You know, stretch yourself, challenge yourself. And you're going to be kind of amazed to see what God does. Um, you're going to have some power. Now, uh, it doesn't make you any more spiritual than someone that's not fasting, okay? So don't let it make your head big or something like that. Uh, if anything, you're fasting because you, your flesh needs to be put down. Amen? So, all right. So, and then another thing I want to look at there in, in Matthew 4 and verse too, it says, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. What is this thing about the 40 days? See, temptations are by and large testing the believer's faith and obedience to see how much the growth, uh, how much growth there's been. So, how are you going to know if you've really excelled in an area without a test? For instance, in institute, we conduct this whole class, and then what? I throw down a test. We're going to see if you're listening. We're going to see if you're taking notes. Because if you weren't listening or taking notes, you're going to fail the test, right? And um, so the same thing, now we understand that in a physical, but in a spiritual, it's the same thing with God. Maybe you've been going to church for 50,000 years. God's not going to know where you are unless He puts some more weight on the bar. He has to test you. He has to see, okay, now that you got your head full of facts, how much in application do you actually have? Okay? Um, how is one truly measured? How are you going to measure the growth in a relationship without a test? So um, there's something significant also about this number 40 I want to look at. It is the meaning of testing. The number 40. I'll give you a few examples if you want to write them down. Goliath presented himself 40 days. 1 Samuel 17, 16. Number two, Israel's wilderness wandering was 40 years. Exodus 16, 35. 
Number three, Elijah was fed for 40 days. 1 Kings 19.8. Nineveh was given how many days to repent? 40. See what I'm saying? Jonah 3.4. And then obviously the text we're in, Jesus was tested for 40 days. So there's Bible numerology. It's, it's uh, by, and, by and large, you're, when you see 40, it's going to be something to do with the test. Uh, these types of things, numerology, it's not always 110%. But for the large portion of when you see 40, you're going to see a test. Now, um, let's look over in verse 3. We're in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 3. And it says this. It says, When the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Um, let me see here. Now, we're going to look at Satan's title as the tempter. Now, in some aspects here, you're, you're going to see... Oh, I should add that verse from Abraham. Go to, go to James chapter 1 and verse 13. James chapter 1 and verse 13. Satan's title there is given as the tempter. So we're going to learn something about this great enemy of God that somehow he's employed by God in the actual act of tempting the individual. James 1.13 says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Who does? The tempter. The tempter. And I mean, we could go back through the book of Job. Nothing came to Job that didn't first come through the fingers of God Almighty. You understand? Now, did God go down there and afflict him with boils? No, not at all. Who did? The devil. So the devil is called the tempter. So when these uh, temptations come, you know that it's not God dangling something in front of your, your face. It's actually the tempter. That's his title, the tempter. So um, in addition to this spiritual attack, the flesh is another medium that's guilty of tempting you. And we're uh, over in uh, James 1.14, I guess I should have to stay there for a moment. James 1.14, you remember the verse, it says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So we understand uh, the flesh and the devil there. The devil being called the tempter. These are the mediums that temptation will often come. Um, now, what I want to look at as well is in verse 4 here. Verse 4, Matthew 4, 4. But he answered and said, is it, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. And I understand, you know, at a, at a church like ours, uh, we, there's local churches. I've attended some that would call us a cult. Why? Because we are a King James only church. Now, for those that will take five seconds to even discuss the topic, we can produce about 200 reasons why but often they don't want to discuss it, okay? Um, now, I just guess I'd like to remind you, I didn't write this. I believe this. I didn't write it, so you don't have to get mad at me. I didn't write it. I just believe it. Jesus is actually the one you should get mad at when it says, man shall not live by uh, bread only, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. You understand the W is not capitalized? Oh, well, Jesus is the word. No, no, that's not talking about Jesus. That's is every word, lowercase. Implying, implying this. When Jesus was around, that every word was available to him. Isn't that kind of interesting? The revelation that God gave, that whole Old Testament, which I would like to point out, there was not one original manuscript left available of the Hebrew Old Testament when Jesus was walking the earth. Not one. But yet, he was under this uh, hallucination that every word was available at that time. Wow. Poor Jesus. You know, he could really learn so much uh, from the pastors that we have today, right? Yeah, yeah glory. You know, uh, you, know, uh, you know, in the Septuagint, in the LXX, Come on. you know, I mean... Uh, 
Uh, where is the Septuagint again? Oh, oh, have you seen the Septuagint? Oh, but no, 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 never mind that. Let's talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Have you seen the Dead Sea Scrolls? I got a chance to see them. Me and Mary Chris, we went for eight days to Israel. And uh, you know, there's, there's Muslims running around the world with uh, these things that they call the Dead Sea Scrolls. And if you would look at them, just look at them, they are such a thorough mess. They're written over, they're scratched out. I mean, they're completely tampered with. I'm glad that I don't have my faith in the Dead Sea Scrolls. I'm glad I got a King James Bible. Thank you, God. That's the book. In, 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 a, in a language I can understand. Wow. Thank you, Lord. But just remember, I didn't write that when Jesus said every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. But I sure enough believe it. I believe it. So, let's, um, let's go ahead and, and kick majority of every pastor in the Antelope Valley right now. Shall we? Come on. Just to keep consistent with loving on them. Let's go to uh, Deuteronomy. Open up to Deuteronomy. Now, I'm just reminding you again, I didn't write these verses. Deuteronomy. Now, you're going to be given a threefold warning out of the Word of God. If you've attended here, you're, you probably know where I'm going with this. If you haven't, you need to know where I'm going with this. Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 32. God says an interesting thing here. Deuteronomy 12, 32. What thing soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish it from it. You see that? <clears throat> nor diminish from it. Now, it seems like God kind of takes His words a little bit personal. I think. You know, uh, well, let, let, let's see if, you know, that's just Old Testament stuff. You know? Let's look at Proverbs 36. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 6. Now, God gives you a warning at the beginning of the Bible, and He gives you a warning in the middle of the Bible. For those that are doing your daily Bible reading, you're going to run into this three times as you're going through your Bible. We're in Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 6. It says, Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. And just for the icing on the cake, let's go to Revelation 22. Scripture with Scripture, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. God makes a doctrine. And the doctrine is about how you're to deal with his words. We're in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 18. It says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. And I know, I know the argument, oh, well, that's just talking about Revelation. What about the other two verses that I showed you? It's not. Line upon line, here a little, there a little. That's how God wrote the book. You can just use a concordance and you figure it out. He's telling you, do not mess with my book or I'll mess with you. Amen. Amen. No matter who you are, you can be behind the pulpit. You can be in a pew. You could be a person that never goes to church. You could be a person that always goes to church. You could be a college professor. You want to tamper with his words? He will tamper with your head. Amen. So it's best not to do it, is what I'm saying. So, so this word, you know, in, in addition to the fast, we have the Lord Jesus Christ using the only offensive weapon in the Christian's artillery is what? The Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. So what makes you think the devil wouldn't want to tamper with your sword, buddy? David David walks into uh, Saul's camp and he took his spear, didn't he? he? Took his spear and he walks out. Then he wakes everyone up. Look what I got, guys. That's what the devil's done with most of your Bibles. If you're not a King James Bible believer, that's what the devil has done with your Bible. 
He walked right into the camp, right into your church, and right behind the pulpit, and the pastor said, <laughs> this is an unfortunate rendering the King James Bible has to say. A uh, better rendering. Amen. You know, uh, I like the uh, dynamic equivalence. Who's, who's that? Uh, oh, what's it? Shane Edelman. Uh, I prefer the dynamic equivalent. Who cares what you prefer? I don't care who you are, my friend. This book belongs up here, not under your feet. Amen. You need to bow to this book. This book doesn't bow to you. Oh, but I prefer who cares what you prefer. That's right. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, no matter what you prefer. I think you need to go back to school. You know, you would think you go to Bible school to learn how to believe and trust in the Bible, but unfortunately, 99.999% of Bible schools are going to teach you out of your Bible. That's right. Wouldn't that be just like the devil? Oh, that couldn't be. That couldn't be. Interview a few of the pastors out here. Interview them. Ask them, where is the perfect, inspired Word of God? Pastor Rich Cow, we talked about Mary Chris, like, you talk about him too much. I just couldn't believe he actually said it. He said it in public. He said, well, that'd be impossible. It'd be impossible. We can't have a perfect word of God. I, I, I asked uh, Shane Eidelman at his Q&A, where is the perfect word of God? He said, we don't have a perfect Bible because we'd worship it or read it. <laughs> Doubt. Doubt. You find the doubt in Genesis 3.1. The first question in the Bible is given from who? The devil. He says, yea, if God said. Yea, if God said. Is that actually what he said? Did he mean what he said? I don't think he meant what he said. Look at Psalm 19. 119, verse 11. Psalm 119, verse 11. You want to talk about temptation? You need a Bible, man. You need a Bible. If you think you're going to stand against temptation, you need a Bible. Why? Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Psalm 119, verse 11. David was under the impression he had the words of God. Poor deluded fellow. This is a picture that the Bible paints of itself. I didn't make this picture, you understand? I just believe it. I just believe it. So, let's next look. Let's go back to Matthew 4. We'll just keep moving on. Matthew chapter 4, we're going to look at verse 5. It says, Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. And saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written. Wait, wait, wait. Who's using the Bible? It is written. It is written. He shall give his angels charge concerning thee. Uh-oh, he removed something. He removed something right there. To keep thee in all thy ways was the rest of the sentence. He removed it. But let's keep reading the way he did. And in their hands I shall bear thee up, lest any, less at any time. Huh? Less at any time. That wasn't in there. Thou dashed thy foot against a stone. Look at Psalm 91. Psalm 91. 11 and 12. Now this is a verse I don't think many uh, Christians would often find themselves reading. But the devil knew it. And he knew it well enough to change it, to put it in his favor. Psalm 91, verse 11, For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Um, they shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. So the devil, uh, he then earns a characteristic of adding and changing the word of God. Adding to and changing the Word of God. Um, 
So questioning the word of God as well is also a characteristic of the devil we just talked about in Genesis 3.1. Questioning the word of God. If you find yourself questioning the word of God, there's a satanic spirit that's influencing you to do that. Questioning the word of God? I thought this was God's holy word. It can't be. It can't. That's not what my teachers taught me in Bible school. I paid thousands of dollars to go to Bible school. And you got nothing. You got taught out of you. you. Hey, man, at least you just got ripped off for a few thousand bucks. You know, you didn't lose your home. You didn't get foreclosed on. You know, if that's all you get ripped off in life, uh, you're not doing too bad, buddy. Start over. Start over. Open up that book and say, God, speak to me. Can I serve in here? See, the tempter, the devil, he understands that by causing doubt in the Word of God, you'll be utterly hopeless against his attacks. All he has to do is put that little seed of doubt. Put that little seed of doubt there. And you're going to be unable to defend yourself. The perverted Bible market shows no signs of slowing down with what? New versions? I mean, I'm telling you this, okay? Now, we're more open to the argument when I'm talking about a Jehovah Witness. So I'll give you an example with the Jehovah Witness. But then I'm going to turn it around on you, okay? Now, me and Mary Chris were talking to a Jehovah Witness at a taco stand. It's a great place to be at a JWM. <laughs> Real good stuff, actually, right on the other side of a tent there next to a Jack in the Box. Great, great tacos. <laughs> Street tacos. They're great, man. So the Jehovah Witness approaches, and uh, sure enough, you know, um, he starts telling me about the New World Translation. Now I was like, I have a New World Translation. I'm, I'm actually fairly familiar with some of the stuff that's in there. And he said, do you have the new edition? And I said, you guys didn't get it right the first time? Man, come on. Now with the JW, man, oh, kick that dog, man. Kick him up and down the street with that. But wait, 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 Christians. What about all these new versions? That came? You didn't get it right the first time? What's up with that? What's up with that? You know, and, oh, well, what about the Miles Coverdale? What, what about the Geneva? What, what about the Bishop's Bible? Those were stepping stones to this one. This was the one that God put his hand on. Where the word of the king is, there is power. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. And he waited for a king to get on the throne that had a Jewish name, James, Jacob. Just a coincidence, I'm sure, right? But this is the one he put his stamp of approval on. Any great, any great awakening that was a true great awakening was attached to this book. Amen. You look at all the preachers of old, this, this book accounts for more souls that have been won than any, any new version. You can add them all together. You know, some, someone told me about the uh, New Living Translation, the Greg Laurie Translation. He said, oh man, just give it more time. Just give it more time. We're out of time, buddy. We're out of time. We're in the lukewarm Laodicean church age. The time is almost up. Amen. The clock is running down. There is no more time. That's why we got to go with what God blessed. He shall know them by their fruits. Oh, well, Brother Randy, look at your small church. You guys, look, just a ragtag group of people. Amen. That believe the book. Amen. Amen. You're going to get much more out of an individual, out of 10 individuals that believe the book, than 10,000 that don't. Mm -hmm. Look what Jesus did with just 12 believers. He turned the whole world upside down. This is a hard saying. <laughs> well, the tempter's tactic, we understand it's removing and adding. We looked at that. We understand it's questioning the Word of God. You know, the average pastor cannot preach his message without going to the Greek and Hebrew Amen. to correct the Bible in hopes of finding a better rendering to cause all the listeners to have doubt in the Word of God. That's the average preacher. Shame on him. So let's keep going. 
Matthew 4, verse 7. Matthew 4, verse 7. Jesus said unto him, It is written, again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Why does Jesus keep doing that? Doesn't he know that the originals didn't exist at that point? How dare he think he could know what the originals said? He was kind of under the impression he knew what they said. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? A few things about this. Um, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. This says a few things. It says, number one, Jesus is claiming to be Jehovah God in Deuteronomy 6. Look at Deuteronomy 6. I'll show you where he's quoting. You probably all get already got it marked down, but just let me go through the motions and read it to you. All these institute graduates. Oh, Randy, give us something new. If it's new, it ain't true. <laughs> Deuteronomy 6.16 Ye shall not... Wait, wait, wait. Who are we reading about here? Jehovah God. Right? Amen? Amen. Yeah, in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy. Ye shall not tempt the Lord your God. You see all those capitals in Lord? It's interesting, isn't it? Wow. You know what? Jesus Christ quoting that verse was saying... I am Jehovah God, and how dare you think you can tempt me? Amen. I created you, and I'm going to bring you down five levels, just like the five I will statements of Isaiah 14. You will be cast ultimately into the lake of fire, you devil. You think you're going to stop me from going to the cross? You think you're going to get me to veer from this? I'm going to set my face like a flint. You're going to see sparks trying to move me. But it also says this verse here in Matthew 4, 7. It says, uh, this says that people can tempt God. Three ways to tempt God. There's three ways that you can tempt God. Number one is misusing the truth for fleshly gain. Misusing the truth for fleshly gain. Look at Psalm 78. Psalm chapter 78. In verse 18. Psalm chapter 78 and verse 18. Misusing the truth for fleshly gain. Psalm 78, 18. And they tempted God in their hearts by asking me for their what? Lust. Yea, they spoke, they spake against God. They said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? James 4 3 says, Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask and miss. That you, that you may consume it upon your lusts. You know what? How you can tempt God, how you might even be tempting Him today, is misusing the truth for fleshly gain. Number two is abusing the truth for worldly gain. We're still in Psalm 78. Look at verse 41. Abusing the truth for worldly gain. Psalm 78 and verse 41. Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Romans chapter 125 says it like this, Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Many people will be much more dedicated to their earthly bosses than God Himself. They'll get up early. They'll stay late. They'll do the long hours. They'll forsake their family. They'll forsake their friends. Forsake their kids. What? Just because the boss asked them to. But yet Jesus might say, hand that person in the grocery store a track. Oh! <laughs> You're laughing because you know it's true. You probably felt it. Come on. Yeah, that one right there. I'm your Lord, right? I'm the Lord. I'm your Lord. Lord kind of means master. Kind of like what I say you do, remember? But, you know, we're living in an age of grace, Lord. I'll, I'll just... <laughs> you 
you know, that, that's one thing, you know, about the church history that you're going to see is that your forefathers were willing to lay down literally their lives to stay right with God. I mean, you, you, you get reading some of the Fox's Book of Martyrs stuff, the Martyr's Mirror stuff, you, you know what you start to see? You start to see a bold confidence in the truth from people that believed the book and believed it enough to let them live their lives by it. No matter what anyone said. The civil authorities come in, oh, break it up, break it up. No, we're not going to break it up. This is what we're commanded to do. Oh, you can't street preach anymore. You let me out of jail today, I'll be on the corner tomorrow, John Bunyan. You know, I will be street preaching because that's what God tells me to do. I can care less what you feel about it. Uh, I mean, these brothers have had it happen. When I preached at the first pagan festival we went to in Courts Hill, this wicked devil from some uh, Church of Christ in Palmdale. What's it called? Christ Church of the Valley. In the Valley, exactly. Low in the Valley. <laughs> now, this guy comes up to me and I'm preaching. He says, how's that working out for you? Right over my ear. Oh, man. How's that working out for you? It's working great, brother! Doing what God told me to do. How about you? <laughs> How about you? Oh, I'm Christian. We, we got a booth in there. In where? In the pagan festival? Your church has a booth in the pagan festival. You know, I think that's a good place for your church. <laughs> you guys are a bunch of pagan. You can care less about what the book says. How's that going for you, buddy? Well, that wasn't very loving, Randy. Why would you do that to him? Because he's devil-possessed. That's why. What would possess him to come up behind somebody following the Bible and say, over in, in over his shoulder, into his ear, just like the devil, Amen. how's that working out for you? How's that working out? I mean, you guys get the arguments. Uh, how many souls do you see saved? Yeah. Come on. You know, I was, I was talking with Brother Mike about it. And it's like, you know what? Every time we go out, every time we lift up our voice like a trumpet the way the Bible says, we get thousands of decisions. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. Come on. Thousands. Either for or against the Lord. Yes. Every time we go, there are decisions. Mm -hmm. How are you doing? How many decisions you got lately? Preach but you know what? The Bible says here in, in uh, Matthew 4, 7, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So we looked at that. People, they... That was Jesus claiming to be Jehovah, but also this says that people condemn God. We looked at misusing the truth for fleshly gain. We looked at abusing the truth for worldly gain. Do you guys remember Simon Sorcerer? Look over in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Bear with me. I know you guys are getting ready for lunch. I only got about 10 more pages left. Yeah. We're almost done. I should have you out by about 10 p.m. Acts chapter 8 and verse 20. It takes some time to study the Bible. we got to take time. You know, when, when your baseball game goes into, uh, you know, more innings or, you know, goes into overtime when... when boxing fight you're watching go, gets a couple more rounds because they're tied for points, you'd stay longer, wouldn't you? Well, what about when God has something else to say? We're in Acts chapter 8 and verse 20. And it says, But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in the matter. For thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And then thirdly, the third way that you can tempt God is accusing truth for one's selfish or satanic gain. Psalm 78, I'll read it, verse 56. Yet they tempted and provoked the Most High God and kept not His testimonies. Now, so far in Matthew chapter 4, we've seen a reoccurring phrase. I wonder if you've pointed out. It is written. 
it is written. Mm -hmm. Now Jesus knows the best teacher is repetition. And I believe that's why he put this in Matthew chapter 4. To show you, when you are under spiritual attack, you need to get together with something that is written. So if the average Bible scholar is true, you have nothing written that you can depend on. But if you just take the Bible for what it says, you got a whole lot written that you can depend on. You can put God to the test. You, you, you can say, God, your word says this, and I'm trying to follow you. You know, your, your word says that if I'm going to put you first, if I'm going to love the Lord thy God with all that heart, all that soul, all that mind, that you're going to take care of me. If it was real at least, right? If it meant what it said. So here we are. Let's keep moving. We're in Matthew 4. Look at verse 8. It says, Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. I want to talk about the devil's kingdom. You guys ever sing the hymn, This is my father's world? You heard it? This is my father's world. To my listening ear, things like that. This is my father's world. Well, not yet. Not yet. Right now, this place is being ruled by the one that holds the title deed, the devil himself. I mean, really, you just with a little sober mindedness look out, you can tell it's written all over the billboards, it's written all over the magazines and the newsstands, it's written all over the people walking through the mall. This place is ran by the devil himself. You know, he received that title deed when Adam and Eve followed him into sin, failing their temptation. They were tempted, right? They failed. And now he's referred to as the God of this world. Look at 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Second Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. In whom the God of this world... Wait, wait, wait. Lowercase g. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Look at Ephesians 2.2. 2. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2. Ephesians 2.2. 2. Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. So he's called a god and a prince. Who? The devil himself. Now I want to point out here, when the devil offered the kingdoms of this world, Jesus didn't say, those aren't yours. Those are mine. Jesus was quiet. Why would he have been quiet? Because they were the devils to give. Well, that's not popular. It's true. Sometimes the truth hurts. You know, the world was his for, for giving it to Jesus. Yet Jesus would not bow the knee because he wanted to fulfill his duty to you. Thank God. I mean, think about it. Come on, Jesus. You... Just bow the knee just once to me, and then, then I'll, I'll give you this whole world. I'll give you all the kingdom. I'll leave you alone. I'll go away. I won't pick on anyone anymore. I'll just go away. Just bow the knee just once, Jesus. Just once. You understand, Jesus didn't even entertain the idea. He didn't even get into the point of debate. Wow. Praise the Lord. He wanted to fulfill his duty, and there was a painful road to follow that led to the cross of Calvary. Yet the devil tried to appeal to his humanity by offering the world without the cross. You guys have heard the phrase, no cross, no crown. No cross, no crown. That would have been Jesus. If he wouldn't have hit that cross, he wouldn't have got the crown. Just like you, if you don't bear your cross, you won't get the crown. you got to bear something. You gotta bear something if you're gonna follow the Lord. Look at uh, we're in Matthew chapter four. Look at verse ten. We're almost done. Believe it or not, Matthew chapter four and verse ten. It says, "Then saith 
Jesus said unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written. Is it really? Is it really, Jesus? Well, he thought it was. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. But look at this. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Look at Luke 4.13. Luke chapter 4 and verse 13. Scripture with Scripture. The Bible is its own dictionary. It defines its own terms. It's a closed circuit. You don't need a, you don't need a concordance. You don't need a uh, Greek Nestle, Allen, Metzger, or whatever. You don't need that. You don't need to know Hebrew. All you need to have is a King James Bible. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Luke 4.13. He's going to give you a little bit more light about this. Luke 4.13. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him what? Oh. For a season. You remember you're in a warfare, sir? Ma'am, you remember you're in a warfare? You are in a warfare. And you know what? You might have won the battle, but did you win the war? He's coming again. Jesus is coming again too, amen? But the devil, he's going to tempt you and leave. Tempt you and leave. Tempt you and leave. But you know, we can take refuge that God has complete control over the temptations that come to you. Complete control. He controls the limit. And he can stop the temptation when it's reached your limit. Just like Job. We understand in the book of Job. All that stuff had to filter right through the fingers of God before it ever got to Job. God said, you know what? You can do this. Just don't take his life. And the devil said, come on, let me kill him. I'm the angel of death. Oh. So I guess God uses the devil in other circumstances too, doesn't he? The angel of death? You think that's Jesus Christ? I thought he's up at the uh, right hand of the throne of God. The angel of death is not Jesus. The angel of death is the devil himself. So look in uh, Psalm 32, verse 7. Psalm chapter 32 and verse 7. Nearing the end here, just bear with me. Psalm chapter 32 and verse 7. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with the songs of deliverance. Selah. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Be not as the horse or as the mule which hath no understanding whose mouth must be held in with a bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. What's the point? God's your hiding place, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that's going to hold that temptation from the point of you breaking. You know, it's, it's kind of like if you're in a gym with, with the heaviest bar that you've ever attempted to lift, but yet you've got somebody spotting you that could pick up three or four of those bars with one hand. That's the point. It's God. He's spotting you. Just try. Just try, son. This is too heavy. I'm here. I'm going to control it. It's going to crush me. It's going to kill me. I got it. I got it. I can, I can hold this with one finger off you. I just want you to try. Put a little more pressure. I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to lighten up a little. Put a little more pressure. Then all of a sudden you're holding it. I did it for you, boy. Look at Psalm 34 and verse 15. Psalm 34 and verse 15. It says, The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and His ears are open unto their cry. God hears you. God hears what you're going. He knows exactly what you're going through. Or you want to trust Him and go through it. You know, you, you think about if some modern-day Christians went through anything similar to what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went through, they would have lost their faith. You know, I tried to serve God for a few years, and guess what he did? He threw me in a furnace ten times high. 
How dare he? Preach. Well, did you go in? No. No, I rejected it all. Nebuchadnezzar <laughs> let me out of that. I didn't even try. <laughs> well, you know, here, I mean, when Ring, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I mean, they, they went in, and the fourth man was in the fire with them. You know, if you would have just went in there, you would have known the presence of the Lord. Because you weren't willing to let God be God. Go ahead, you just stand on the throne of your heart. And then lastly, 1 Corinthians 10.13, about temptation. And we'll close with this. 1 Corinthians 10.13. First Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. But will with the temptation also make a way of escape, that ye may be able to bear it. So how do you get the victory over temptation? Well, number one, through the faithfulness of God, and believing, and quoting, and using the Word of God? If you just quote it and use it without believing it, you understand there's no power. you got to believe it. you got to believe it. And remembering that Christ is the mediator between you and the Father, He's ever living to make intercession for you as we speak. Personal prayer, fleeing the temptation and resist it. That's how you're going to succeed against the temptation. That's not even what I think. That's what the thus saith the Lord says. It's not what I think. My mind is so decrepit. I come to this and I'm enlightened every time I look at it. Like, wow, I'm wrong here, I'm wrong here, I'm wrong here, I'm wrong. Just ask my wife where I'm wrong. She'll tell you. Amen. Amen. You know what? If anyone knows what's wrong with you, it's your wife. Amen. You know? But if anything, that should just drive us to the foot of the cross. Believing what he said, what he, what he, what he meant when he said it is finished. Did he mean what he said? Oh well, in the original Greek, uh, it meant something different. You can keep your original Greek. My hope rests on this. This is a document that can be tested. It's a written document that exists. You can test it scientifically. You can test its geography. You, you, can, you can test it by uh, those that have followed it. You know, the, uh, the testimonies of the witnesses. You understand what I'm saying? You can test this thing. Some unwritten, unavailable, original document when they never all existed all at once. You're going to put your faith in that? Go to hell. Let's trust Jesus Christ in this book. I'm not saying go to hell because I'm it's just like, if you don't believe the Bible is the Word of God, what's more orthodox than believing the Bible is the Word of God? Well, that's not a hill to die on. Come on. Yeah. Not a hill to die on? My whole eternity is riding on these pages. Maybe yours isn't. Maybe yours is riding on a baby sprinkling. Or an experience, like what we talked about this morning, an experience. Mine's right, right on this. I hope yours is too. The you know, Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're not saved today, you must be born again. Don't leave here if, if, you, if you're not sure if you're going to heaven when you die. We can take some, we got a number of people here that can just take a few moments, share some verses with you, how you can know you're going to heaven when you, when you die. Do business with Jesus. Amen. Well, let's close in a word of prayer. God, thank you so much for your mercy. Thank you so much for your grace. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you for standing against temptation on our behalf. We never could, Lord, but you did. You accomplished it. So, God, all we need to do is put our faith and trust into the finished work of the cross of Calvary. And I believe most here have done that, Lord, but if there be one, Help them to do it today. Help them to call upon you. And bless the rest of the service. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. All right, open up your hymn books to page.